Wonderful. Can you see my screen or yes, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can see. Great. Um, we have started seeing participant trickle in. That's great. Uh, we'll let a few more people arrive before we get going. Hello, Klaus. Hello, Emily. Hello, Coco. Hello, Carl. Hello, Brandon. Hello, Adrian. Great to see you all. Open up Q&A as well. Wonderful. All righty. Um, for the people who are trickling in here, I'll tell you that because we are we're doing sort of a run number two on this webinar because there was a lot of um, great reception. And this time we're trying to do it at a time where we have even better coverage of time zones. Um, but it's difficult, but in to honor that and sort of to to celebrate that. I have my coffee here, morning coffee for you all in the Pacific time zone. I hope we have someone in the audience in the Pacific time zone, at least for you, DJ. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, I have my water because everyone needs water. And then in case things start going crazy, I also have an Icelandic beer here for the people in the later time zones, you know, because, you know, that's how we roll. <clears throat> Glenn, what are you drinking? Is that a, do you have beer? No, I don't have beer. I don't have beer. If I would have known, I would have opened the beer. <laughs> exactly. DJ, we, I mean, I know it's early for you, but. Yeah, a little 9.30 a.m. local, but if we want the, <laughs> the Q&A to be good, uh, maybe I'll have to take one for the team. <laughs> your, uh... your, your boss isn't watching anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We have an upgrade from your boss. We have you. Had a wonderful. Um, I suggest we just kick it off and we'll do a bit of a sort of a bit of house cleaning before we start. Uh, how to get the most out of today's session. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts. So please share them. We want your perspective. Share your own thoughts, insights, experience in the chat or comment. Um uh, or comment on YouTube later if uh, if you're watching this um, after the fact. Uh, we want you to ask questions. We have a goal today to try to have um, the presentations a little bit shorter than last time and go into Q and A a little bit sooner. Uh, uh, we have a few questions prepared, um, but. Um, uh, we are also really excited to hear from you all. So post your questions in the Q&A and we will try to get to them live, but otherwise you can follow up on Slack and we have a community uh, for that if you want to join that uh, to keep the conversation going. We can You can both follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter um, and just add mention us in juicy conversations um, or join uh, the AVO community uh, on Slack. And then if anyone's having any audio or video issues, we would like to fix that together. So please call that out if you're having any trouble hearing us, seeing us, or reading the slides. Quick and... heads up, Steph. I got somebody saying that the chat is disabled, so they're not able yeah. to dump any questions in. Great. Well, we'll use what we have. The, the Q&A is working, though. Chat is disabled. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, Let's see if our uh, behind the scenes host Hatla can do something about it. Otherwise, please use the Q and A to post any, you know, chats directly to us. Um, but thank you for the pointer. Um, I think it was Matthew that was pointing this out. Thank you so much, Matthew. We appreciate it. Um, we'll hopefully see some. Um, chat's opening up but otherwise just continue throwing in questions if they seem minor don't worry about it um probably other people are wondering about the same great 
Uh, so we will move over to introductions and I'll throw the ball over to our very own Glenn. Take it away, Glenn. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I feel like that's a famous line from a movie. Um, <laughs> so uh, my name is Glenn Vanderlinde or Glenn. I'm a co-founder at Human37 and what we do is we are a customer data strategy mm -hmm. agency. We help organizations build their customer data infrastructure, do a bunch of analytics and activate that data, which is the most important part. Uh, we focus on business questions, like making sure that data supports the growth of your business through personalization, through whatever the objective would be. We are a mixed panel platinum partner or whatever the highest rank is. That's what DJ <laughs> granted me yesterday. And then based, we're based in Brussels, Belgium, but we basically operate globally. That's it for my end. Thank you, Glenn. Um, is it me next? I'm next. Wow. I'm Stefania Olafsdottir. Uh, you can call me Steph. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AVO. Uh, AVO exists to inspire better data cultures so teams can build better user experiences. We specifically focus on this by helping fix data quality in product analytics. And what that means in practice, we help teams like Walt, Fender, Bill, um, Ikea, and Boost to plan and implement and observe their analytics so they don't fly blind and fail to build great user experiences. Um, we specifically believe that it's important to fix data quality at the source where the data is created by the producers and then cross-functionally, which means it's collaborate, collaboration between the data producers, which are product engineers, for example, and data consumers, which are analysts and product managers and things like that. Um, I've personally been in data science for over a decade, and uh, my, my personal passion is to really help people build better data uh, cultures because I believe that creates a world with fewer miserable data scientists, which I was for a while until I took matters into my own head. Um, and over to DJ. Hi folks, yeah, I'm DJ. I'm a product manager at Mixpanel, spend my days on the data governance side. So really spending a lot of time thinking about what Steph is talking about, being more intentional about your data governance and data trust, making sure your team uh, can actually achieve that vision of data democratization with Mixpanel. Uh, I've been in the data analytics space for like three-ish years now. Uh, really, I've uh, been obsessed lately with this idea of like, how do we help people make better decisions with data? Um, and Mixpanel seemed like the perfect place to do that. Um, Mixpanel is analytics for everyone is the vision, trying to help uh, not only product managers, but now marketing data teams make better decisions with their data. Um, our goal is to be the fastest and easiest um, analytics tool on the market. Uh, we have an event-based data model that makes it really easy to uh, answer questions quickly with less SQL, um, uh, less code. Uh, we try to play nicely with whatever data warehouse or data um, databases you're using, uh, data stacks you're using. Um, and we work, we have the pleasure of work, working with some of the the best companies in the world, Ubers, Mondays, Yelps of the world. So um, really excited to be here today. Nice. Thank you for joining us. And for you all uh, who noticed this minor detail that uh, the event was promoted uh, with VJ, but we had an upgrade to DJ, which is fantastic. Um, so, but I want to point this out also. I was an early adopter of Mixpanel um, back in my, when I was a founding analyst of QuizUp. And uh, we were using product analytics and it wasn't even called product analytics then. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, yeah, I've been a fan of the point and click experience for a really long time. And I, um, I'm excited about the vision of doing it for everyone, um, not just product managers or people that enjoy SQL because it's also, even though it's not SQL, it's sort of, it's the same structures. So that's, that's great. Same way of thinking. Um, okay, let's dive in. Um, so we have some, one, one hypothesis that we want to set the stage with that product data is uniquely complex compared to other types of data. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we focus, for example, on data quality for product data at AVO. 
Uh, if we compare it to other types of data, for example, marketing da data or third-party data like Stripe data or something like that, your product data is ever evolving. It doesn't stop changing because there's no such thing as a ready-made product, which means there's no such thing as a ready-made data set that just describes the product. You will continue to evolve your data structures and, and sort of... Um, the names of your events and the names of your properties and what you need, what types of properties uh, you need on each event and things like that. That'll continue to evolve while you're building your product and it changes with every single product release. And so that's why it's such a fragile thing to get that um, data quality correct for, for product data. And we wanted to start with sort of a, a real life story. <laughs> Um, so as I mentioned, I was the founding analyst of QuizUp, and um, we had a huge problem with data quality over there, of course, um, as all companies do, around our product data specifically. Um, uh, and we ended up building um, our internal solutions for it at QuizUp and pro processes and tools that helped us manage product releases alongside analytics releases and make sure we were always measuring things in a great way. We'll talk more about that later in the talk or in the session, but to set the stage, uh, we wanted to sort of talk about a real life example of what a data bug can do to a product team and for, for like the developing your product and go-to-market strategies. Because if we fast forward a few years after QuizUp, I started a company with a couple of friends of mine from QuizUp and, um, we uh, it was in the first three or four months of the uh, journey that we actually had the exact same problems at, that we had at QuizUp, um, where we uh, sort of found out that uh, we had uh, uh, an account created event and it had a property called sign up method. And we discovered that 98% of our users were using the e email sign up method. And only 2% were using the phone number sign-up method. Um, and we're like, okay, let's simplify the onboarding process and stop asking people to choose between those two. And let's drop the phone number method. Um, we decided to do that based on this data. Uh, but what happened is we ended up seeing uh, a plummet in the conversion for our sign-up funnel. So 80, 81% used to convert from uh, getting the app to completing an account creation and it went to 46%. This was after we removed the phone number sign-up method. Um, and it seemed like a really straightforward decision as you uh, saw looking at the data. So we, of course, got, went back and looked at the data. Um, and what we learned is that we didn't only have email and phone number in the data. We actually had one phone number without the B um, because it's really easy in life to make typos. And this happens all the time for big companies and small companies. The scale of it uh, can be like, it seems like this tiny, tiny thing, a typo, but the impact is something like this. And this is not only, does not only cost us the experience of all of the users that came and joined here uh, during this process. It also cost us the development time where we were sort of preparing the release here. And then here we were sort of waiting for the data to trickle in and sort of figuring out like, does this really look like this? And then after it, we have to revert it. So it costs weeks for us as a startup. We were a young startup at the time. Um, and now, for big companies, this is like many months of processes and can be like tens of dollars, uh, tens of thousands, of, tens, tens of millions of dollars in revenue to um, to make to to make mistakes like this. And this is just to highlight how a tiny mistake, tiny typo, can cause these mayhem <laughs> issues. Because often when we talk about these data quality issues, they just seem pretty minor. And you're like, yeah, sure. I mean, you'll just fix the typo later, right? But it's not the same to fix the typo in the code as it is to fix the, the typo in the data. So this is just to get us all warmed up and fuzzy about some uh, painful data stories. Um, I will now hand the ball over to Glenn. Glenn, do you want me to keep sharing? Uh, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. No, keep sharing. I think it's less annoying for people. Cool. So we're going um, to go three common pitfalls, and Glenn is going to take us through the first one of no standards. 
Correct. So what are the common pitfalls that lead to poor data quality and then impact stuff just exactly like the way that Steph uh, showed you? There's three things that we're going to share today. No standards, tracking and as an afterthought, and trading speed for quality. Um, let's start with uh, no standards. Um, it's actually a fairly self-explanatory idea, I guess. Um, the main reason why people make a lot of pitfalls is because you're basically running before you can crawl. And I know that that's not the most popular thing to say. Everybody wants the result without putting in too much work, I, work, I guess. But when it comes to product analytics, um, it really pays to pay attention and spend some time into architecting the way you're going to send in data, have a conversation about what you want to achieve and making sure that everybody's aligned. There's like some core principles that you can fall back on that everybody knows and shares within the organization. So you basically don't have to think about it, it becomes second nature. And two of these elements are basically taxonomy. And the second one is cardinality, controlling your event cardinality. So let's start with that one. Before we go to the next slide, can you go to the next slide actually, Steph? Mm -hmm. This is basically what people um, think the world looks like and how successful organizations leverage data, right? We collect data, from that data, we derive insights. From those insights, we are able to activate the data and activation in data can mean anything, basically. If you're in marketing, it can mean optimizing your campaign, figuring out which audience works, which doesn't. If you're in product, it could mean like figuring out which feature is key in order to get people to the next tier of your membership or understanding where people drop off because some of the fields, just like Steph said, don't really work out for them anymore. So based on that, we can build best, better customer experiences. And as a result, our business will grow. We're going to have to say it in product terms, more weekly active users, monthly active users, or even daily active users. As a result, we're going to get more data and the flywheel will continue to actually um, optimize itself, if you will. Now, this is how successful organizations do it. In the next slide, you basically see where it goes wrong. And where it goes wrong in a lot of cases is on the data collection to insights. You can collect as much data as you possibly want and even like could store, I guess, if stuff isn't done the proper way, like getting to insights is incredibly hard, uh, incredibly hard. Um, there's two main reasons for that. One is, like I said, event cardinality. What is event cardinality? Event cardinality in product analytics or in event-based analytics as a whole is actually referred to as the total number of unique events you have. Uh, most of the work, and BJ might know this because he's in data governance, that we do when we look or we audit mixed panel accounts where people are struggling to figure out uh, the insights or to derive insights from the data actually originally originates from event cardinality. It means that some people or some organizations are super proud that they have over 200 events, unique events stored in their accounts, but it doesn't really facilitate the leap going from data collection to actual insights, right? Why? Because it actually creates more, uh, it creates more opportunity to create errors and to misinterpret data. And so reducing your event cardinality is super important in order to facilitate easy analysis. Second part is everything about naming convention. If I'm a developer and I would wake up on a Tuesday morning, like some people are on the West Coast, and I feel like putting everything in snake case this morning, and then tomorrow I wake up and I put everything in camel case, well, that's a different quality problem, right? <laughs> uh, and it means that the same thing doesn't actually mean the same thing because we're comparing events and events in the end are strings. It means that application opened in camel case or in snake case won't be the same thing. And as a result, all of your reporting will be wrong. You'll need to go through a bunch of hassle in order to correct it. And then from there, you'll need to fix it. I'm going to show you a quick actual example that we had with one of our clients. Um, if you look at this interface, it's an older screenshot. Um, but this is basically some of the analysis that, that the client would do every day. So they store it as one of their standard uh, cards or dashboards, if you will. But it's a thing that will give you a headache, right? And it looks like they're trying to analyze the super complex, super advanced thing. Um, I have to disappoint you. The only thing that they're actually analyzing is the source medium through which people were registering. And the reason why it's so complex is because of the way that their data structure was set up. They had a huge amount of cardinality in which they needed to filter down and drill down. And as a result, you had problematic data ingestion people were getting a headache of doing analysis 
As a result, they stopped doing analysis. And so the value of product analytics was reduced to zero. As a result, the progress was as well. Can I go to the next one? Basically, this is what their initial events have looked like when we start optimizing it, right? On the left-hand side, you actually see what they think was 20 events. In reality, they're 19. They actually didn't realize that they were missing one. One of the problems of not controlling your event cardinality is losing oversight of which events are there, which ones are not, and how do they relate to one another? But basically, this the use case was there's a paywall at some point that will pop up. And what they were interested in was figuring out which paywall was the most successful at driving conversions. So we have a bunch of paywall prompts and a bunch of paywall clicks, right? These are all top level events. When we entered the account, no properties were being used. Now, if we would go to the next step, you actually see that because there is a joint key, if you will, there's clicks and there's prompts, we could actually bundle it, which is what you see in the last slide. And so we reduce this entire setup into two events. We also showed them that they were actually missing one. They were missing one of the clicks or the prompts. I don't remember by heart, but they were assuming that they were doing analysis on 20 events while they were actually doing on 19. And as a result, falsifying uh, their entire insight that they were getting. What we've done is we've replaced the 19 events or 20, depending on, on which side you're on, uh, and flipped it into two events. So it became a paywall click and a paywall prompt with a single property, the paywall type. And as a result, you actually get very simple analysis going forward. If you now look at the dashboard and see what the steps were that people needed to do, these are like <laughs> over 11 clicks. And all of a sudden now we can just select two events, break it down by the paywall type. And all of a sudden I have a perfect overview of which one was actually working the best for them. There's a multitude of elements that make that event cardinality is important to control. As you see, there's the lack of oversight that you generate at some point, but there's also the lack of self-explanatory analysis. An analyst now can simply come in and figure out like, hey, I need to get some insights on which paywall works the best. Let's just grab the paywall click or the paywall, uh, uh, the paywall view event or impression event and break it down by type because everything is wrapped up underneath it anyways. And the result is that you make less mistakes and data is more accurate. Now, the second element we talked about is everything with regards to naming conventions. The advice is very simple. Use clear human readable events and property names. That's on the next slide, Steph. Can actually go too forward. Uh, what does that mean Like when I say event and property names? We call it taxonomy or naming conventions, whatever. There's a bunch of things and your developers like usually will have a preference. There's snake case, there's kebab case, there's camel case, there's Pascal case. There's a bunch of like probably more exotic stuff that I'm not even aware of. The most important thing is there is no right solution as far as I'm concerned. The most important thing is to make sure that you're consistent and that it's easy to read. That's why we always opt for a human readable event and property names. So if we would conclude in a nutshell, what's the most important thing uh, to resolve the pitfall of not planning ahead? to invest time and effort into planning something before rushing into. I know everybody's eager to get the data into the platform and start analyzing, but it really pays off to just sit down with everybody, take an hour, take an hour or two and discuss these standard or basic elements. What will our naming convention be? And how many events are we willing to ingest knowing what the total customer journey is that we're willing to track? That's it, simple. <laughs> Thank you so much, Glenn, uh, for highlighting this. Um, I will throw it over to DJ. Yeah, thanks, Steph. And thanks, Glenn. I think that was actually the perfect tee up into this section. Um, as Glenn recommends, like being thoughtful about your tracking, sitting down and being really intentional about what you want to track. Um, the natural corollary, corollary, I guess, is why doesn't that happen? Why is tracking an afterthought often? And I like this problem. It's why I spend my time thinking about data governance at Mixpanel. It's a fundamentally, uh, we think about it as a fundamentally human problem, uh, which are the best kinds of problem because it's messy, it's irrational. Um, there's no easy answer. It's a very durable problem. Um, and the way I think about it a lot is in terms of incentives and effort. Uh, maybe that's my business finance background. Um, but I think when you think about data governance, everyone has different incentives, uh, different motivations, and so how do we uh, uh, help 
kind of align those incentives and reduce friction to make tracking less of an afterthought, more of an intentional practice. So Steph, if you go on to the next slide, yeah. So this is a perfect <laughs> example, I guess, of how common this is. It happens to everyone. This is actually not only internal to Mixpanel, so this is a screenshot from our internal Slack, but also actually me in the in the Slack. <laughs> uh, this uh, is me and the engineer on our team. Um, basically like suffering from the same exact like tracking as an afterthought problem that uh, we just discussed. Um, the story here is we, uh, one of our engineers had just worked on uh, really rapidly actually developing a new feature to assign owners to events. So basically if you have follow-up questions about an event, what does it mean? Or can I make changes to this event? You know who to go to as a point of contact. Um, the engineer had done a great job of building it really quickly, faster than we expected. and was all eager to go and roll it out. Um, and I had to sort of pump on the brakes and be like, oh, wait a second, like, do we have the tracking in place? Are we sure that like we know uh, we will be able to know if this was a success or not? And so I think key takeaway here is like it happens to everyone. Mixpanel is a product analytics company and something we still suffer with, uh, suffer from trying to find that balance between speed and quality and impact versus effort. Stefania is going to talk more about that Uh uh, trade-offs between speed and quality side, but at least for us and how we think about data governance, um, this highlights this very real problem of misaligned incentives maybe. And so if you go to the next slide, Steph, yes. oh. the way I think about it is like the different players in this game have different incentives where engineers, if they don't care about data quality, data quality will suffer. And oftentimes that might happen because if you're an engineer, for example, at Mixpanel, one of the core competencies that we look at in leveling and uh, people who rise quickly at Mixpanel is speed as an engineer, speed and quality. And so when they're thinking about what um, to focus on, it's a lot of times let's ship really quickly. Let's get this out to, to customers. Um, mm -hmm. And meanwhile, there's other players like data, instead of data producers here, like the engineers, data consumers who have a vested interest in uh, as much like metadata and descriptions and images as possible to understand what they're looking at. Um, and that's sort of diametrically opposed to this, like, let's move quick and ship and break things. It's let's be thoughtful and make sure if you're like a leader or a data consumer that we're, we're shipping is the right things that mm -hmm. we're able to measure what we do, um, and make sure we know, uh, what events represent, uh, especially when you're struggling from that event cardinality problem that Glenn had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and mix panel, how we think about it in the next slide is uh, twofold, I guess. Um, one on the incentive side as a company, uh, just making sure that uh, impact over effort is prioritized. So that's something that's very cultural, like when you're celebrating wins or you're thinking about what like leveling looks like, leveling frameworks look like, and what are like the outcomes that are associated with a promotion. Uh, trying to emphasize impact over just feature factory shipping a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think if you're in this room, that's probably you're bought into the fact that data-driven culture is important and that should be baked into culture, so company culture. So I thought for this slide, we could spend more time on just uh, how we do it from like a friction and like process perspective. It really is just baking it earlier and upstream into our product development uh, life cycles. So on the left-hand side, there's an excerpt or a screenshot from uh, our product requirement documents or PRDs. Um, every product uh, development process at Mixpanel starts with a PRD. I think it's relatively common at most uh, EPD uh, uh, product orgs. Um, and one of the required sections in that is this measuring success uh, section so that before any engineering work starts, any design work starts, everyone is sort of aligned on what are what are we trying to drive um, mm -hmm. with this release? Um, very similar to uh, the PR FAQ framework that Amazon popularized, just being intentional mm -hmm. about fast forward a few months when we built this or a few weeks when we built this, what's different about the world um, mm -hmm. to make sure you're being intentional um, uh, using tracking as a forethought instead of afterthought. And then the other thing is product reviews. So on the right-hand side, we do a lot of quicker product reviews in Slack but even still, um, we're expected to sort of, everyone attaches uh, metrics that they're trying to drive with different releases, are soliciting feedback on like, are we tracking the right things here? And especially on a story basis, you see Julia is not actually talking in 
uh, Julia, who's a designer actually, is not talking about metrics and like very nitty gritty event names. They're talking about things in stories of like, if they do this, then we should see this happen. Yeah. And trying to answer, um, put frame tracking as more of like a human um, uh, thing. And so uh, that is just two ways, I guess, that we think about uh, faking tracking and uh, product analytics more upstream in our processes. The other thing is like retros and um, uh, making sure that you're actually going back and seeing did what we set out to do actually happen or not. Um, so TLDR, I guess, uh, tracking as an afterthought is very natural, happens to even us at Mixpanel very often. Um, it's a dirty, messy human problem of incentives and effort. And so the way we think about it is baking into your culture, being more intentional upfront, and then reducing friction by just baking into your product development processes, like in your PRDs and your product rituals. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. And so I can hand it off to Steph to talk more about. Nice. DJ, before I move on, uh, for uh, everyone who is curious what PRD, EBT, and the PRFAQ <laughs> stands for, can you tell us? Yeah, PRD, Product Requirements Document. So it's where we align on what are we, what are the requirements from a user perspective, business perspective, uh, engineering perspective that we want to honor when we build this feature so that we are solving for certain user uh, or, yeah, I guess different stakeholders goals. Mm -hmm. EPD, engineering, product, and design is what we call our like broader product org. So those three key stakeholders. And then uh, PRFAQ uh, is press release, frequently asked questions. It's- I uh, think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's an Amazon product ritual where PMs will write um, the press release for a feature before they've done any development work on it to, um, sort of make sure that you're thinking about, okay, if we invest all this time, what actually is gonna be the result of that and framing mm -hmm. it in like a user uh, centric uh, way so mm -hmm. that it's like, you're talking to the user, like here's what we've built, here's what problems it solves for you. So it's very similar thematically of being intentional about your product development processes, thinking about impact upfront instead of as an afterthought. Nice, thank you. Um, cool. So I am going to talk a little bit about trading speed for quality, which is sort of uh, the situation that many people end up in um, when they start wanting to do things intentionally, following standards and making sure tracking isn't an afterthought. Um, I'm going to start by framing sort of and looking at like, what does the actual problem look like? What does the typical analytics workflow look like? Just to set the stage for us all. Um, so we start at sort of what we often call just step zero, which is a little bit before the analytics workflow. This is the product phase. Uh, we're working on defining something in Figma or a Google Doc or something like that. Um, it's a product manager position. It's a product spec. Then we move over often to talking about analytics. And then we might pull in an analyst or we're a product manager and we just do things ourselves. Um, but at that point, we often move into other, other, other tools as well. We might move into a Google Sheet or an Airtable or a JSON file or something like that to define the metrics, like the, the high-level goals potentially and the metrics, how will we measure that? So circling back to um, by doing X, we should improve, uh, we see improvement in Y. That would be the high level. And then we add that maybe to a sheet, but also the literal events that we need to be able to fulfill a metric like that, or sort of understand and, and measure that. Um, and then we go into getting sort of some feedback and requesting implementation. And the people that we need feedback from at that point is product managers, uh, engineers, and analysts. Like all of these roles need to contribute to this decision because they have three different perspectives on it. We have uh, product managers who sort of understand like what is that high level lift that we want to see? Well, how are we going to measure success? We have the analysts who understand how we use our data. Like what are the tools that we have to query our data? And that, thus, what structures do we need? And what data do we have? And how can we use that? And how can we expand on that? And then engineers, product engineers, have insights into well, how does the product work technically and what can we track in what way? So there's this collaboration that has to happen between these three stakeholders so that we can design good data. And this happens on like a Slack and uh, and, and Miro and in Figma and in uh, Jira and wherever. 
Um, and often decisions get made here about changing the tracking spec that don't get reflected in the spec uh, then. So it's often outdated before even you sort of move into implementing uh, your analytics. And then the developers sort of decide to implement it. And uh, we end up with all of these different versions of the analytics event, not from a single developer in a single implementation, but because um, analytics events, they are they represent a user interaction and should represent a user interaction. And a user interaction can happen on a lot of different places in a single product. And there is a, there are a lot of different codes behind us behind something that us, the users, find pretty simple and straightforward and should just be simple. Um, so you can end up with all of these different versions of the events, which is exactly what Glenn was highlighting uh, and happens all the time. Uh, and and what 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 the impact of that is is what he was highlighting, where you think you have all of the data about when a song was added to a playlist, but maybe you have only one of the six events or three of the six events or something like that. And then in the next release of Android or iOS, then you even get the seventh one. You know, it just this happens all the time. But in the going back to the process itself, then after the implementation happens, then someone, uh, often the analyst, sometimes there's a QA person, sometimes the developer himself or themselves uh, go into using their human eyes to look at what um, the data looks like in your analytics tool and compare it to a Google Sheet uh, of the spec. And this is obviously very error prone and we're not going to catch all of the issues, but often we do catch some of them and then we have to throw it back to the developers and sort of beg them to fix it. Um, and all of these steps, this is what makes it so painful. This is what why people hate asking someone to implement analytics. And this is why developers hate being asked <laughs> to implement analytics. Um, but there's also sort of a mindset challenge there, which is um, that analytics is a chore that that developers do for an analyst um, versus um, analytics being one of the fundamental things that we have um, as developers to improve our products. So anyway, this is sort of why this is so dysfunctional like there are so many breaking points and and then to continue the circle you we, we basically start using our tools to analyze our analytics and um analyze our data and user experiences and then we go in circles like this again but typically here even though we try to catch these things then we just don't catch all of them and we still have a dashboard full of issues so uh, i just want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the maturity journey in the context of uh, trading speed for quality, this is the journey that uh, we see most organizations go through. They go th from like a place of winging it, like we just use our gut feeling, we have a strong hypothesis about what decisions we want to do and make, and that's where everyone has to start. Like before you have a product, you have to wing it and go on your gut, right? Okay, and then we go into sort of a wild west where we um, typically like it's every team for themselves. Uh, roughly it's like um you know the the paywall team versus the playlist team versus all of the they all have their own versions of their data and they just continue implementing data on their own <laughs> excuse me um and so what we have here is sort of most teams are able to be self-sufficient about their own data but as soon as they need data from someone else then they won't and there's no central overview of what's happening in the in the, in the company or in the product. And that causes this problem of, um, you know, that's that's where the phone number problem happens, you know? And then we move into trying to govern it a little bit. We move into some sort of a centralized governance. So there will be a, a, a person or a team that takes on or sort of gets assigned or ends up with, <coughs> excuse me, I'm heading out of a, coming out of a cold. so. My voice is sort of not prepared for this. Um, yeah, so we head into the centralized governance where a single person or a team sort of ends up owning, stopping product releases from going out before uh, it, there's been proper evaluation of what's happening. Um, and that person or that team, they don't like doing it. And the product team does not like being slowed down. So nobody really likes this state but it's sort of a, almost a necessary, necessary evil 
to get to a state of good data fast, um, to uh, where you have sort of self-serve governance with some low global standards in place where everyone, every team follows some global standards like the naming convention or the casing convention um, and, uh, and and things like that. Um, but this is sort of like a step that most companies end up taking in the beginning while we're figuring things out. And at that point in time, we're shipping products a little bit slower and it's really frustrating um, because we have experienced how terrible it is to be here and be making bad decisions based on incorrect data, because that's really painful when you have that happen to you the first time. And so we go from no data to bad data, to slow data, to good data fast. And that's sort of the maturity journey that we see people go through in this. Um, and if we look a little bit at what the utopian state looks like, if we compare that to the other um, typical analytics workflow, we want to have processes and tools in place uh, that facilitate cross-functional collaboration at the source. Um, and this is an example of this workflow with Avo um, here, but overall the message is you want to think about what kind of tool you have in place to be able to facilitate this journey with fewer steps and a more unified source of truth. And so in Avo, you can plan your analytics update uh, from a metrics perspective and for, from an event perspective. You can get a, a review and a, an approval, uh, a, re a review and an approval from your uh, stakeholders. Um, and Avo will also notify you when things aren't fitting standards. So you have less of like needing to be the human that calls these things out. I remember one of our um, community members said, Avo is the, well, actually person that you never really want to be yourself, you know? Um, and then you go into implementing analytics um, and Avo for supports you as a developer really well there by ha enabling you with code generation. So you get type safe wrappers around whatever analytics SDK you are using. Um, so you can read more about that on our docs. But you also, we also have a lot of other tools that support developers in implementing according to specs. Um, so this is just one of those. And then for the validation step, Avo also supports you in that. And we both have like an Avo dashboard that shows you, uh, we call it inspector, that shows you exactly what the status of your data is uh, based on what we've seen in development and production uh, and based on what you've planned in your sort of, in this release. And you also have like an in-app debugger for your apps, for your web app or for your mobile app, where which shows you exactly when the event is getting triggered. So I would encourage you to sort of take a look at what you could build or buy um, for getting a sort of unified solution in place for this. Uh, and then sort of um, this, this is all happening on a, on a branch within Avo. And so you could also be doing this on a, on a Git branch and sort of building on top of that. And then you merge and publish your branch and then you get your specs directly into your tool of choice. Um, and that's something that I'm going to preview in a, in a minute. Um, so I would really encourage you to think about like, how can you get um, these tools in place? But before anything, this is about culture. Like DJ was saying, like Glenn was saying, this is all about culture. What we believe at Avo is that even though this is a very cultural challenge that we have to go into, uh, cultures can be supported with tools, just like peer review culture when you're a developer can be supported with Git. Like GitHub supports peer review culture. That's great. Um, and um, we have tools that support this cross-functional collaboration at the source of where the data is created. So um, bringing the governance into code, I already talked about this, um, and then bringing the data context into the analytics interface. So this is something that's really empowering. Um, Avo automatically publishes the specs of the events that you define in Avo into your Mixed Panel instance. Um, and for example, that means that when you are building a chart in Mixed Panel, you will have the description for this event right here in place. Um, from the moment when you define it in Avo early in the process, even before the product was implemented, you know, that also means you can 
build the dashboards in Mixpanel even before you get the data. That's also one of my favorites about doing this this way. So when you have defined the metrics that you want, uh, even before it's implemented in code, and even before the feature is out, you will be able to get to the definitions of the events into Mixpanel already and start building the charts, even though they have no data yet. And then you can um, have the dashboard ready for when the feature actually goes live. That's really convenient. Then you don't have to think twice, you know, like think through twice. How did I want to measure the success of this again? So that's it uh, for this. Um, uh, uh, basically, we want to encourage you to adopt clearer standards. Consider tracking as part of the release process. Do some kickoff pro meeting with the team even before the developers start implementing the feature. Um, not, not when the feature has been implemented and um, then go and design the analytics. Um, and then minimize sort of handoffs and sort of streamline this analytics workflow process is uh, what we encourage you to do. Um, so with that, uh, I'll head into the Q&A, but before we bring up questions, did you want to add anything, Plan and DJ? Did I forget mentioning anything here? <clears throat> oh, Not okay. Okay. Crystal clear. Crystal clear. Had a great. So we have some questions answered already in writing, but I want to call them out. Um, there's a great call out here from uh, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Doesn't needing to be explicitly define events all the time, um, needing to explicitly define that, result in only behavioral events being tracked from the point onwards that you think were relevant. Uh, meaning that ex explorative use cases, like for growth experiments uh, that require historical data, become vastly more difficult or impossible. Wouldn't it be better to have some some sort of a, an implicitly defined event mechanism? This is such a great question and it never gets old. This is an evergreen subject. Glenn already wrote up a, a great answer to this. Um, Glenn, do you want to quickly um, discuss your, your take on it? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to find whatever I said so I can... So basically, yeah, in my head, at least, this question is kind of like the whole auto track versus precision tracking. Exactly. Somehow, um, from a planning point of view, there's a point I'll address. From a planning point of view, I, I get it. Like, it means like if you don't track everything, it might be that you're missing out on something. The thing is, a lot of organizations track everything out of the box with bad governance and with bad planning. And at that point, everything becomes such a mess. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a huge fan of auto tracking for that reason, mm -hmm. because people think that the data will be self-explanatory anyways. I like to start with the hypothesis and build around the hypothesis. That way we have a goal. Uh, it's one philosophy. I'm not saying you should worship it or adhere it. It's just one point of view. Um, what Matthew, I think, aims at, and we've, in another conversation, I had this conversation with him already, so it's funny. Uh, hints at is that with the whole concept of automatically building tracking templates and adding context to it, meaning that you don't necessarily need to know what you're tracking, but you know the concepts that you're tracking. A uh, very simple example is like if you add widgets to your pages, like start tracking those components or start tracking those widgets, and then the context will give or the context in which that widget will be used will contextualize the event itself. And it's kind of this approach. And so in my head, it sits between like explicit tracking and it sits between auto tracking because the mechanism is automatic, but you've taken some time in order to at least structure to your data. And I think that's the most important thing. But again, that's my two cents. Yeah, and Matthew shares also his other two cents uh, as a follow-up on this. Biggest problem for me with explicit tracking is teams talk about tracking and not enough about goals and making bets on what feature releases should achieve. And I couldn't agree with that more. And so that's also one of the things that we encourage our customers to do. <clears throat> Just anyone that I uh, ever consult about this is think about data as a top-down activity. So start with your overall goal, um, then start thinking, okay, what is, what is the literal metric that I will be able to use to figure out if I achieve this goal? you know, like day one retention or something uh, of, or day one retention of those that saw a specific green screen. Um, and so 
And from there, you design your analytics events. Um, that's always how we think about it, top down. Ma goals, then metrics, then events. And we have a blog post about this. If you Google AVO purpose meeting, tracking the right metrics, then you will find that post. Um, we can have it as a link in, in resources um, as well. But overall, I just want to echo most of what Glenn said about auto tracking. And I think it's a fallacy that I, I think it's I, I feels good. It's probably good to have something in place that's sort of like close to a catch-all. But the catch-all is a fallacy because you still might have not have the right metadata property attached to your like track everything um, events. And so you will end up with a lot of data that not necessarily everyone can use. Um, it'll take someone, a data expert, um, a lot of work to be able to wade through the data. And um, they might or are likely to actually never do that because it's such an issue and it never gets prioritized because data work is so differently from engineering work or product work often because there's no guarantee that you'll find anything interesting. <laughs> like you might invest a lot of time in digging into some data, but there's no guarantee that you might find anything interesting. So it's often difficult to prioritize data explorations. Um, <clears throat> about the, like, uh, will we then always only have data for, um, for the things, the questions that we thought of in the beginning or at the time? So I think that if we ask the right questions and good questions, then we end up with data that tells us um, very good stories that are input into the next hypotheses that we have to um, explore. That's usually the case. Um, and then of course we can uh, continue working on that with qualitative um, questions as well. Um, but Matthew, I think like, you know, let's definitely continue the conversation and um, feel free to, continue um, asking follow-up questions on this. I suggest we also move into this great question here from Emily. Thank you, Emily. Um, as a product manager, how would you approach uh, remedying a taxonomy that is already very disorganized? For example, I have inherited a product with events that use multiple naming conventions, missing properties, etc. Such a great question. And I can't believe you're asking this. We're about to roll out a product at Avo that um, literally helps you get from that good bad data to good data and um, highlights the issues that you have with your data and like the duplicate events and the duplicate properties and the missing properties and allows you to turn them into actionable um, issues that you can sort of prioritize and triage. So you could create like a prioritized list. Um, so that's always the start, uh, in my opinion, is sort of figuring out what is wrong with your data um, and then sort of prioritize. Like what are the what are the important events that you need to have consolidated? Um, and then you need to figure out, are there any downstream um, impacts or issues of literally fixing those events in your source code where you're tracking them? Um, like, is there a downstream dashboard that depends on you having this old weird data bug in place? <laughs> that can sometimes be the case, you know? And so we have to tread carefully when we start fixing these taxonomies. But um, uh, yeah, I would generally recommend um, taking it step by step and start with the most important events. And depending on how much um, ownership you have of uh, the product, how big how big your ownership is, do you own the entire product or a part of it, then like start with your sections. Um, start with the things that you can have some control over and sort of don't try to boil, boil the ocean or or try to fix like the North Star metric of the entire organization if you are only focusing on like a part of the part of the product. So that's my two cents, but I'm curious to hear what DJ and Glenn have to say about that. So on, on my end, this is like typically one of the things that we, one of the most uh, biggest problems that we see when we get accounts that need audits or that like need mm -hmm. a review 
typically there's like a couple of things. Usually we dig into the lexicon, the mix panel, if it's in mix panel, the lexicon feature to like export everything, figure out what's there, then figure out like, hey, what do we no longer need, right? Because if, if you're talking about, I inherited something, there's a bunch of taxonomies. It usually also means that there's a bunch of events that we actually don't need. We get rid of that. And then we start building a new tracking plan that we prefer. And we kind of do yeah. it in stages where you say like, hey, these events, Let's just start by fixing the naming conventions or the taxonomy. And actually you can do that in like the whole lexicon section. You can like transform events to custom events. It's a cosmetic fix because your source data will always still be kind of corrupted, right? But then Mixpanel helps you transform it and in the UI, you won't notice anything. So your end user will no longer be confused. If you have a snake case and a camel case for the same thing coming in, we can actually merge it and you'll only see one event and it makes everybody's life already easier. And then from there, we actually go back down the lineage, like Steph said, like, where does the data come from? And now we start fixing it at the source. Mm -hmm. Question is, if you need more properties, et cetera, you're down for a potential minor re-implementation of some events, but like, again, don't boil, boil the ocean. Like if there's stuff that we can fix in lexicon, let's fix it there because it's an immediate pain for a lot of people that's done. Mm. And then from there, we just trace back the lineage of the data and figure out like, Hey, at the source, what do we need to change? Mm -hmm. The pragmatic way, I guess. I think that's a great point that the only thing I'd add is that element of prioritization and like ruthless prioritization of, what are, I mean, Emily, as a product manager, you're very busy. You have a lot of other ways to spend your time. And so thinking about what events, what properties are actually being used and are the biggest bang for your buck in terms of remediation, at least you could start that way. Uh, start with those, be more pragmatic. Um, at Mixpanel, we just released a uh, metadata feature to show like who is querying what events, uh, mm -hmm. what properties are they using, what reports are they using it in. So you can kind of see you're not wasting time like cleaning up events that no one's using. You can just dispose of those right away and then work with a tool like Ovo or with Glenn's team to like figure out uh, how you clean up what actually matters. So mm -hmm. maybe that's the only thing I'd add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Great. Or both, both both Glenn's team and Avo. Um, uh, and I'll add to the, just to the, the idea of the, or like, I love this framing Glenn, the cosmetic fix <laughs> versus yeah, fixing it at yeah, the source. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, you don't want to go bother engineers because there's priorities and like Mixpanel already like offers you this way to kind of fix it. And yeah. it means that the analyst doesn't get bothered anymore with the confusion. So if you can remove that, it's kind of the whole thing of like, if it's annoying to do it, people won't do it. Yeah, And so if you already take away that, because the data is there, it's just probably in some cases that it's not coming in the right form and then Mixpanel can solve it in the lexicon. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and I just wanted to add to that. I remember, like, I think it's great. It's a great idea to do the quick fix with the cosmetic fixes, <laughs> if you can. Um, and if that sort of enables some parts of your team to run faster, for example, or things like that. Um, the, the challenge that we... Um, that uh, we've heard our customers talk about on why they sometimes even prefer to not do cosmetic fixes um, is that that might cause confusion downstream when you have an analyst that sort of comes into mix and is like, hey, great, yeah, okay, I'll query this event and this event, and then I have that data, and let me now go into the data warehouse and do a deeper dive. You know, because that's a common thing that like most maybe product use cases, product manager use cases and engineering like quick questions, you get your answers really well in most cases in mixed panel. And then you as an analyst, if you're tasked with a more complicated um, question, then you might end up in the data warehouse and doing some something more complicated and modeling something and, and, and tying it with other data or whatever. Um, in those cases, um, it can be a source of confusion if your data structures don't match what you see um, over there in Mixpanel. That's one of the reasons why I have historically heard from our customers that they're sometimes afraid of doing the com cosmetic fixes just at the end, wherever that happens, and that they're really, they really want to fix it at the source. Um, having said that, I think it's really important to not get stuck in over-engineering, right? So I think this is a, an important thing to keep in mind that you, ideally you want your data correct at the source so it matches at all of the different locations that you have it. Um, but, you know, 
if you have an opportunity to do a cosmetic lift <laughs> with a quick uh, and a quick sort of impact, then uh, go for that. Um, uh, let's do one more question and then we are at time. Um, and I'm, I'll say this now because we're hitting the clock and I encourage you, I'll add, uh, I'll move a slide here to, to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and join our community. Uh, so if there's anyone that has to dance out now, then uh, at least you have that information. But um, uh, we have another question here. Um, boom. How to eff efficiently bucket events into meaningful abstractions with standardized values and help make that bucket widely adopted in reports? Um, I assume this is refer referencing, Glenn, your sort of, um, um, how, how, what's the right level of abstraction of events? It's a hard question. I kind of like wonder, wish we could like grab Matthew and put him in here. That would be a very interesting conversation. Yeah. Uh, but like a, a good level of abstraction is like, um, the example, I think the example I gave is kind of like one of these abstractions, right? When we start planning with customers, they do like, um, buy button selected or download button selected or it should just be button selected that's a level of abstraction right button selected is a level of abstraction and then the properties will give you context around that typically if you want to abstract the way we look at it is like if you have a page or a website or a uh, content management system a cms is like look at which which elements do you actually have to build up your page or build your application and use that as a top level of abstraction there's a bunch of forms, there's a bunch of call to actions, there's a bunch of pages, there's a bunch of videos. And then use that as a level of, of abstraction because the rest is kind of like metadata or context that you can actually put in there. And so that's the way I, I like to think of it. It's very web and application driven though. So if you would go to another level where there would be a data warehouse involved or a CDP involved, you need to think about it like in different ways, like what are the objects or the actions that I could consume? And that would be your level of abstraction at that point. Mm -hmm. Very abstract way to explain it, but there's no other way to explain it, I feel. <laughs> yeah, I would add to this also, like I am not a fan of button clicked events or um, like in general, I think they are too generic. And I think, and I always recommend that people name their events by the user action that's actually happening. And that's and the reason why that's helpful is that that helps you build a flow that makes sense yeah. when you're using and analyzing your data. Having said that, it can be good to strike that balance that Matthew was highlighting in the beginning of the conversation, which is how do we strike a balance of intentional tracking, but also something in the direction of a catch-all. So for example, uh, I think a, a, a nice like navigated event or or like page view like a general navigated event that tells you where the user is coming from like which screen they're coming from to which they screen they just came to i think that's a nice sort of general abs abstracted event and then other than that, that than that i really like to think about it in like instead of like click the button they were adding something to the cart or something like that um but this is a hot topic as well <laughs> so um do you want to add anything to that, DJ? No. Great. No, so we're already three minutes over time. And I just want to say, Glenn and DJ, it's been a pleasure being with you here today. Um, Thanks for I'll having go us. Ahead, I'll go ahead and open up. The yeah. Speaker. I was going to say, it's time for that beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for your great questions. Please continue the conversation with us online. Um, and... Don and DJ, look forward to our next session, whenever that will be. Cool. Same here. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening or day or whatever it is. I'm very confused with time zones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have a good evening, day, whatever it is. Um, we'll see you all soon and see you on the internet. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you.